I mean, think about this church going through the civil rights movement, um, the assassination of John F. Kennedy, uh, Vietnam. I mean, you know, we've had people that served there. Um, Desert Storm, um, the war in Iraq, uh, 9-11, Oklahoma City bombing, just all kinds of things that have happened in the last 75 years that pastors um, have navigated through and hopefully put our faith in God. And it's, it was so funny. I was like, I was like, well, I guess here, here it is, the coronavirus. That's what, that's what, you know, this, me as pastor, that's what we're dealing with is the coronavirus. But you know what? Um, through all of those previous things, here's, here's what we know. The church, uh, Bain Chapel, and those that, that really name the name of Christ, the church endures. You, you can't, see, the church is bigger than a building, it's, 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 it's bigger than, than a denomination. It's bigger than a country. The church of Jesus Christ, will. it's the only guaranteed thing to continue on for life. When, when we get into heaven, um, there's not going to be you know, any of the systems that we are familiar with here. When we get to heaven, it's all going to be gone except for the church. So, so you know, keep connected to the church, whether we're meeting online or whether we, we keep opening here. You know, just, just keep on keeping on because we know that... Jesus said, even the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church. This, this declaration that Jesus is king. And uh, I, I mean, the gates of hell, to me, seem a lot more uh, powerful than the coronavirus. Amen? Uh, but Jesus said, even that's not going to stop the church. So it's, it's, it's a thing. And we're just going to keep moving on. And uh, I'm glad that you came today. I, I've been really... Um, just fascinated, excited about this series. Uh, this series um, is actually about, you know, we're talking about controversial things. We've got the coronavirus, we've got politics, and then we've got money. And it's like, Jordan, what is the deal? Um, but yeah, I wanted to take three weeks to talk about money matters because da, 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 money matters, right? Money, it does matter. And, 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 and like I said before, and, and I, I don't know if I'll say this next week, but, but you know, I always like to put a disclaimer out there. Uh, perhaps when I talk a sermon about money, the last thing you want to hear, if you're watching this, the last thing you want to hear is a preacher, another preacher talk about money. Because you've probably seen somebody on television or you, you see somebody you knew growing up that was a greedy preacher and he was just trying to get money and if you gave him $100, he'd give you some sort of magical cloth and then all your problems would go away. But, but I just want to rest your you know, worries or concerns or anxiety because I'm just not that kind of pastor. I am just not that kind of pastor. Um, for me to preach on money it is not so that I can get in your wallets, okay? Yes, I'm financially supported here with the church, but uh, whether or not you give to this church or whether you give to some other church, my concern is that you understand what the Bible says about money and that you can reorient your life to that. Whether or not you give here or not, the church could really use your money. I get that. And especially with the coronavirus and everything, and we won't have the opportunity if, if things get worse, maybe to meet here for a moment in time. Please, please, if you're giving to this church, please keep giving. The church could really use your money, especially during this time where we're trying to, you know, get through this situation together. So don't stop giving and don't stop. I, I get that. But, but look, there's something bigger to this. Whether you give to our church or not, whether you give me anything or whether you never give me anything, God has a purpose and a plan related to your money. And we're really going to see that today really going to see that today. Now, uh, why does money matter, right? Why do we have to talk about this in church? Why is it even in the Bible? Because it is in there. It's not just, you know, something that's not in there. What I brought up is that the reason why money matters so much to us is it impacts our lives. It just impacts our lives. And then today we're going to see that money is emotional and there's a reason it's emotional. There's a reason if you're married, you've probably had um, some very important or critical discussions about money, some of which maybe, <laughs> you know, ended in a fist fight. I don't know how your marriage is. We, we, we don't do that, but, but we have had some very important discussions about money, and money is emotional. It is emotional. People are passionate about their money. Uh, you know, when, when the stock market took a, you know, a dive and now it's back up, it's, for people that follow the stock market, I mean, it's like 
stress is like, and that is like, oh my gosh. I mean, money is emotional. If, if tomorrow you went to, uh, you know, withdraw some money from your bank account and they said, well, you don't have any more, I promise you, your blood pressure would go through the roof immediately. Money is emotional, and, and we're going to really find out why. But here, here's a, a question that I really want to unearth today, because we, we know of money being emotional. We might not know why. But here's another question I want to get into today. Why does God even care about your money? Like, why is it even in the Bible? I mean, you know, yes, it's emotional. We know that we have to have discussions about it. It stinks not having money. Um, It's empowering to feel like you do have some and you have options. We hope that we can retire one day and have some money and not be pressed up against it. I mean, we we understand that. but, But why does God even care? Why does he talk about money in Scripture? Why does he talk about your money and giving in Scripture? Why does he care? Now, now here, here's really what I want to debunk. I want to debunk the idea that you may have or someone you know may have. This is the idea that God cares about your money because for some reason he needs it. That, that if you don't give to our church or, or somewhere else, then God's not going to get done what He needs to get done. And so He wants your money because He really needs it. He could really use it. I mean, you know, God's, God's you know, like this, you know, eternal person with, with a cardboard sign, you know, saying, please, please give to the church. I, and people aren't going to get saved if, if you don't give. And, and we won't be able to keep the lights on. And, 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 and it just God needs our money. But the reality is, and I don't mean to compare Jesus uh, or, or God to a homeless person. That's, that's a bad analogy. But, but the reality is, is that God does not need your money. He doesn't need your money. And the reason I know that for sure is because of the first message. And if you have not seen the first message, you can go on our website and you can go on YouTube. It is uploaded and you need to watch that message because it really builds the whole foundation of this series. God doesn't need your money because God owns everything. He owns it all already. Those of us, even Christians, who think that we own like 90% and then God owns like 10%, or that God cares about our money because somehow he's, he, we, he, he thinks we owe him and, and he, he wants us to give because you know, he saved us and he's given us heaven. After all, the, the least we could do is throw some money in the offering plate. Really, if you understand what Scripture teaches, you understand God doesn't need anything from us. He doesn't. He has it all within himself. He owns everything. And even if he didn't own everything, but he does, even if he didn't, he could create money out of thin air. So, you know, we talk about money doesn't grow on trees. Well, God can create trees, and he can create the paper plants and money and all of that. He, he doesn't need any of our money. That's not why God cares. That's not why it's in Scripture, really. There's something else that God wants. Because God owns everything, and even what we have, we're not managers. I mean, we're not owners of the money. We're just managers. So God doesn't need our money. There's something else God wants. And to get there, to understand what God really wants, and the whole reason, really, I think, why money is in Scripture. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. If not, that's okay. Uh, We're going to try to provide those on the screen for you. Matthew chapter 6. And we're going to look what Jesus says about money. Because Jesus talked about money. Hello. But what Jesus says about money is just so huge. It will help us understand why is money so emotional? Why do we argue about it? Why do we fight over it? Why are wars started over money? We're We're going to learn why that is. And also we're going to learn why does God even care if he doesn't need it? Why, why are you supposed to give in church if God doesn't need your money and he can just create buildings and he can, you know, he can certainly pay me or keep me? You know, why, why? Why does he involve us in the process? Why doesn't when God need to do something, he just creates it out of thin air like he created the world? All right, Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. This is what Jesus said. Jesus said, do not store up for yourselves, treasures on earth. Now, what Jesus, I I believe, is attacking here is not the idea of treasure, right? Some of you have some things in your life, things you've bought, things were given to you. 
It, it might be in a car, it might be a hobby, things associated with a hobby, might be a gun, might be a boat, fishing lure, whatever it is. You might have some things that, that are important to you. I don't really think that, that Jesus is, is, is calling out again that. It's not necessarily the treasure as much as it is the place of the treasure, where it's at. He says, don't store up for yourselves treasures, and he's talking about material things, because... He's saying, don't store up your treasures on earth. That's what Jesus is trying to say. Don't be a hoarder. That's storing up for yourself treasures on earth. Well, I might need this. Well, you've never needed it up until now, and it's been 10 years. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, don't just constantly accumulate treasures on earth. Okay? And, and this is what Jesus says. Let me, if you need a reason other than you can't get around in your house, let me give you another reason. Don't store up for your treasures on earth because moth and vermin, mouses, <laughs> and, and, and all other stuff, they destroy. And if they don't get to it, if thieves find out that you have it, they'll destroy it. <laughs> right? I mean, um, unless you're like some skilled person, you can only fire like one gun at a time. So you can have 50 guns, right? Um, but if 50 people come to your house and you're not able to take out everyone, you know, it's going to be you against all of them. I'm just saying, like, you know, be careful that you, you're not just arming the other army, you know, because very easily, those of us who think that, you know, we've got everything said and, and we're just storing, storing, storing and we're going to be okay, it can quickly turn on us very, very quickly. Because if, if just rust and erosion doesn't get it, the thieves will get it. And if the rust and the thieves don't get it when you die, people at your yard sale will get it. That was how that works. <laughs> Be careful how much you invest in your hobbies because sometimes it doesn't even translate to your children. I mean, how many of you have had had a grandfather or a father or, or someone in your, you know, one of your parents or grandparents pass away and they had all this hobby stuff? And then you're just like, well, I, I just don't really know what to do with it. I mean, you know, they were into collecting these things. I don't like to collect these things. So sometimes it doesn't even cross generations. So Jesus is trying to say, look, look, don't store up for yourself treasures on earth. He says, I'll tell you where to put your treasure. He says, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. So Jesus is saying, I'll tell you where you need to put your stuff. Don't keep it here on earth. Well, somewhere else will go through it. Someone else will, will go through it uh, when you're gone because you can't take it with you. I want you to send your treasure on ahead because if you store up treasures in heaven, that's going to be a place where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. Heaven does not have a locked door. <laughs> it doesn't have to. The only people who get into heaven are those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ. And no thieves and murderers and, and, and all of the, the sexually immoral, all this stuff that's what it says in Scripture, these people do not inherit the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God doesn't have to have police. The kingdom of God, the heaven, where we're heading to as Christians, it's a place of eternal things. And what does he talk about? Because you can't, you can't like airmail you know, your possessions and your valuables somewhere to heaven Jesus is saying, you, you've got to get your eyes off of having treasure in material things, and you've got to get them into having things that are supernatural and that are eternal things. Every person that you lead to Jesus, that you invite to this church, could end up being a work and a treasure that transfers over to heaven when you get there. I tell you this, we're not going to take all this worldly stuff. I'm not going to be able to take a single guitar. I'm not going to be able to take my car, my house, all these gadgets. I'm not going to be able to take a TV. But every sermon that has made a difference in people's lives, every time I've had a conversation with somebody and it lifted their spirits and the Spirit of God worked it through, those type of supernatural things will go ahead. And what we really need at the end of our lives is not a bunch of stuff that's going to get auctioned off. What we really need is to have a, a bunch of people in heaven who were there because of what we did and who are waiting to thank us when we walk in the door. I don't know how you feel, but, but what was that? What, what is the line of people that Billy Graham had waiting on him when he got to heaven? Now, I know he's not perfect. He's just like you and me. He's sinned. 
He needed grace just like... But just imagine, that's just an example. Imagine how many people were waiting on him once he got to heaven. People from other countries. People that didn't live as long as he did. That's the, the works. That's the treasures that he stored up. Imagine, how, imagine what the line had to be where he's just shaking hands. You, you spoke at this. You, you said this. You sent this out. I was at a rally. I was at, I was at something you were at. That's what Jesus is trying to say. He's not saying don't have treasure. He's just saying just make sure your treasure is in the right place. And then, and then that, that's just good wisdom right there. That's just straight up good wisdom, right? But, but this next verse is where Jesus truly tells us why money is so emotional and why treasure is so emotional. It, it, it's the same reason why if you know somebody who won't throw something away and you've tried to get them to throw it away, you don't use it, you've never used it, you've maybe used it once, it's just taken up space. And the reason why they're, mm-mm, nope, 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 don't do it, don't do it. I'm not going to get in your stuff. You don't get in my stuff. This is, we're just holding on to this. This is, Jesus explains. Let me just, I'm going to tell everyone, this, this wisdom, whether you're a Christian or not, this wisdom alone is just is, is amazing. This is what Jesus says. I'm going to tell you why money's emotional. I'm going to tell you why God cares about it. For where your treasure is, wherever it's located, whether it's in your garage, whether it's in your basement, whether it's in your bank account, wherever it is, or even where it's in heaven, wherever it is, there your heart will be also. See, this is what Jesus is trying to explain to us. He's saying, I can tell you why money is so emotional. I can tell you why you argue about it. I can tell you why you get so frustrated about it. I tell you why you fight for it and why you know, you're, you're rushing in trying to make sure you're taken care of and, and you're worried about money all the time. I can tell you why that is. Your heart follows your money. There's a connection there. Your heart, your will, your emotions, your hopes, your dreams, it follows your money. Because all of us want to put our trust and our faith in something we can see, right? That explains why, myself included, why I usually may not pray over a situation until I've ran out of physical options. Once I know that I can't buy my way out of it, once I know that the people around me can't fix it, then it's like, well, I've done all I can do, I guess i got to pray. But that's really messed up, right? That, that reveals that really my heart has been following the things I could see instead of my faith being put in the things that can't be seen and the things that can't be taken away. Really, prayer should not be a last resort for us. It should be the first resort. That's where our heart should be. And your heart and my heart follows our stuff. So that's why it's emotional for us. Because every time we spend those dollars and every time we transfer money or we buy something, a little piece of our heart goes with it. That's why it feels so good to buy something if you're a shopper, right? You've got 18,000 shoes and it just feels good every time you get another one. Or or maybe it's something else, whatever it is. You, You buy another this or that or another outfit, or you buy another vehicle, or, or, or you, know, you, you buy something else related to your hobby. There's something in you and me that just feels good about that. You're just like, man, why is that? When you bought that, a part of your heart went with that. Wherever your investment is, wherever your treasure is, your heart will follow it. I can look at, I've said this before, I can look at your calendar and I can look at your checkbook register if you still have one. The majority of us, we just, you know, I, I get that. But if you still have a check register where you've written down everywhere you've spent money, I can tell you where your heart is. I can tell you what you care about. You, you care about living in your home. <laughs> you care about having food. You care about making sure your kids are taken care of. You care about whatever hobbies it is. I can tell you what, you're, what you care about, where your heart is by where you spend your money and where you spend your time, where your treasure is, your heart is. And this explains, this explains, pay attention to this, this explains why God cares about your money. Let me 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 say it a different way. God can create anything He wants and anything He needs. He he can just do that. So He doesn't really need your money because He could just create it. And then, matter of fact, Jesus, um, or just say our Heavenly Father, God, God 
Not only can he create anything he wants, he can take anything he wants. Hello? You know the very breath that you and I are breathing right now? If God decided no more, he could snap his fingers and we'd stop breathing. No hope. God could take anything. So you know what it relates to your money? If God really wanted your money, if God really needed your money, you know what he could do? He could snap his finger and everything you own and everything you had in your bank account could be gone. See, we... It's a really bad mentality, and it's not biblical, but I, I, I felt this way. It's so hard sometimes for us to give because it's emotional. And when we give in the offering plate, we're like, oh, man, this is my heart. This is, this is you know, if I don't have this, I, you know, oh, my gosh. It's a struggle for us. But if you and I really saw God for how big and strong and powerful He really is, it shouldn't be a struggle because we, we, we should recognize God. If you really wanted it, you wouldn't need me to give it. You could just take it. That's how big and amazing and almighty God is. So He could create it if He wanted to. He could take it from you if He wanted to. So the very fact that He hasn't is, is just total grace. But here's the one thing God can't create. He was, he's refused to, not because he, he, he doesn't have ability, but one thing He has chosen not to create and one thing He has chosen not to take from you, among many things, but one in particular. God has chosen not to create you and me in such a way that your heart is automatically His. And God will never force Himself on you or use His power in a way that takes your affection and puts it towards Him. God will not force you to give Him your heart. And that's why God wants your money. Not because He wants or needs your money. It's because your money is connected and follows something that God does want. God wants your heart. So let me just to say it in a different way. Your heart follows your money. And so God is after your heart. Every time you spend money, every time you receive money, every time you, you, you deal with money, there's a piece of your heart that is connected to it because where your treasure is, your heart is. And since your heart follows your money, God cares about your money because He is after your heart heart. Your heart is the one thing that God has refused to just take and say, you know what? I'm just going to force you to love me. I want to be loved. I want to God doesn't do that. He never does that. To love God is a free will choice that you alone can make. He will not force himself on you. And he will not manipulate you, give you some sort of potion number nine or however. He's not going to manipulate your heart in such a way. No, you alone have to willingly give your heart to God. Because that's what true love is. True love does not force its way on anyone. It requires the other party to voluntarily give of their heart. And that's what God wants. God is after your heart, your devotion towards Him. And God knows He doesn't want to just create it out of thin air. He doesn't want to take it from you. He doesn't want to force it from you. But He does want it from you. He wants your heart. He wants you to love Him. And He loves you. But He knows it's all a voluntary thing. He can't force it upon you. So what God does do is say, okay, if your money is going to follow your heart, then here's what I want you to do. I want you to learn how to give me your money because every time you give me your money, you're giving me your heart. You're giving me your heart. Jesus even continues... Um, opening up this, this scripture, he even it makes it you know, even more real. He says, the eye is the lamp to the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body is full of light. He's using a me metaphor. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Jesus is trying to say, it's important to understand the right way to see about money. Because your eyes light up your whole worldview, how you see things influence your life, if you see money in a good way, then your body and, and, and your life is going to be filled in a good way. But if you have the wrong perspective about money, you're going to be messed up. It's going to be really, really dark. Jesus even puts it a different way. No one can serve two masters. 
Okay, no one's going is he changing is he changing the topic? Is he switching something other than money? He's not. Listen to what he says. Either you will hate the one and love the other or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. Okay, so Jesus, where you were starting to talk about money and how we got to view it right and how we got to put our treasure in the right place because our heart always follows that. Are you just changing subjects now? Now you're talking about two masters? Jesus is like, "No, no, no, no. I'm not talking about two masters." In fact, he, he would say it this way, you cannot serve God and money. Perhaps your translation says mammon, translated wealth, money. This is what Jesus is trying to say. He, he's trying to say, your heart follows your money. It follows your stuff. Whatever you put your treasure in, your heart is going to follow that. And that's why God cares, not because he needs your stuff or your money, but because he cares about your heart. And, and this is what he's trying to say. Listen, the connection... The, the pull that your heart has towards your money is the same kind of pull that a slave has if he has to choose between two masters. This money thing is a big deal, according to Jesus. Jesus is saying, you're going to have to be careful because money is actually going to want to run your life. It's not just going to be a part of your life. It's not just going to want to influence your life. If you let it, money will try to be a master of your life because whatever you're giving your heart to becomes someone or something you submit to. And Jesus is trying to say, look, it's a big deal. Your heart follows your treasure, and wherever that treasure is will eventually and can eventually become your master. Your heart follows your money. And so God is after your heart. So two questions I want us to think about as we um, finish out today. What are the reasons, what are the reasons why money is so emotional to you? I want you to think about this. You just, you know, you can talk about this over lunch today or you can think about this. What are some of the reasons why money is so emotional to you? It could be, I don't have enough money. Um, Well, just be honest, uh, you know, I I know we we say this, uh, but really, uh, as Americans, we have a lot more money than people in other countries. Just saying. But, you know, just talk about it. Why Why is money emotional? I don't want to poke fun at you, but why is money so... Talk about those reasons. Well, it's because it's, it's my values or it's, I just, it's my sense of security. Just, just own it. Be honest why money is so emotional. Um, if you're married, talk to your spouse. It, and it just, why, why, why do we have so many arguments about money? Okay, and, and don't start the next sentence as because you spend so much of it. Don't say that, okay? No, just <laughs> don't do that. But just, just talk, why, why, why is it so emotional for us, right? Could, was it because you grew up in a home where there wasn't any, and then when you finally got some as a young adult, you just was just like, I'm not going to poverty again. There are people like that. They grew up in poverty. When they get out of that, they're so afraid of ever going back there that, I mean, they're, they are not going to spend nothing. They are, they're just going to hold on and hold on. Or maybe, like me, you have an issue with spending. And, and it just, you, you just, you're addicted to the emotional feel that it that has whenever you buy something. You know, ding, ding, ding. You know, woohoo! It just feels good. I just, I need some shopping therapy. Maybe, that, maybe that's how you feel. Talk about why you feel that way. Get, get down underneath. And, and then the other question is, what do you think it means for money to be someone's master? Is there someone you know of who is you? <laughs> you know, like asking for a friend. Is there someone you know of that feels like money drives them? It, it's almost like it's a master. I mean, th- this, is, this is true. The scripture talks about the borrower is a s- slave to the lender. So for those of us, myself included, that, that have some sort of debt in our life, we're paying for a house, we're paying for a car, we feel the struggle for money to be our master. You know, we get up and we don't want to go to work or we don't want to do these things and, and we feel that struggle. Well, I got to go. I got to go. Like one of the seven doors. I, I owe, I owe. It's off to work. I go, right? We, we feel that. We feel that struggle. So, so talk about it. You know, am I going to be one of those people that's constantly going to be mastered by money? Am I going to be one of those people who stores up all my treasures on earth or am I going to be open to the idea that God actually cares about my money because He cares about my heart. And it's the heart of the matter that makes all of the difference. It's the heart of the matter that makes all of the difference. Let's stand up together. Um, 
I want to encourage you to come back next week, Lord willing, if everybody's healthy and, and this and that. I want to really encourage you to come back next week because I'm going to talk about ways that we can give um, to our church, uh, ways we can give online. I'm going to talk about taking a step for that. Um, but before I got to the actual asking part, I wanted to set things up. And it's, if you didn't get to hear last sermon, please go online and watch that because I really want to get us on the same page. God owns everything, okay? So he doesn't need your money. He owns everything. Um, so we don't give because we owe God. He, everything we give to God, he already give, gave us in the beginning. But then the second part of that is money and our heart, they're, they're, they're connected in some powerful way. And, and I want you to get that. I want you to understand that that's why it's so crazy. That's why it's hard to give if you're not used to giving. But on the flip side of that, if you and I could learn to give to God, whether it's through church or whether it's, you know, through some... If you and I could learn to give to God, there's an opportunity for our faith to grow in powerful ways. Powerful ways. So really, this sermon series, although I hope that you learn to give to our church because we do have some needs that, that are pressing in on us, what's really going to happen is there's going to happen something in you if you learn to give, if you learn to give that up. You're going to see your heart follow where your money goes. And if it's in heaven, if your treasure that you get is given in heaven, you're going to see your heart go to eternal things. And there's going to be something that's going to happen in you. And it's a powerful powerful thing. Amen. So let's bow our heads and we'll just pray over this time together and we'll just send you on. Lord Jesus, I pray right now if there's anyone who's not a Christian, Lord, um, that they would take that step and follow you, that they would put their trust in you based upon the cross and the resurrection. God, ultimately, um, what, what we need more than anything is, is salvation. And that only comes through what you did on the cross and the resurrection. So if there's anyone here that's not saved, I pray right now during this prayer that they silently or out loud pray to you to ask you to save them. And Lord, for the rest of us that are here that are Christian, I just pray, Lord, that we would get our eyes on you and we would realize that Lord, money is emotional and, it, and it's probably always going to mean something to us while we're here on earth because just as Jesus says, our heart follows our money. Maybe we didn't really think about it that way. Maybe we just thought that, hey, if we were just rich, we wouldn't worry or money wouldn't be a big deal if we didn't have to think about it. But, but really, Lord, whether we're rich, we have a lot of money, or whether we don't have hardly any money, our heart is still following that treasure whether it's a treasure of a few dollars or millions of dollars, our heart follows that. And that heart is what you really want. So Lord, I just pray that as our minds wrap around the idea of why money is so emotional and why you really want it, I pray that we would be open to say, all right, Lord, if money and my heart are somehow intertwined in some way, please help me give you my heart by figuring out how to give you my money. Not because you need it, not because this preacher is asking for it, but because I want to make sure you have my heart and you know that you have my heart because, Lord, you will not take my heart. You will not force me to give you my heart. You're just going to ask me to give it to you voluntarily. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done. In Jesus' name. And Lord, before I close, I just want to pray again. Please keep our country safe and our businesses safe. Uh, please help our church spread correct information, not just hearsay, but stuff that will help this situation forward until our country can get past this. And we give uh, you the thanks and praise for what you're going to do in these next few weeks. In Jesus' name, amen.